Hello everyone and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in beautiful Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Rob Strecce. Rob, we're both fresh from the main stage this morning and the themes of the day are really uh, about simplifying, demystifying, making AI easier. Yes, and I, I think again, we have the perfect person <laughs> to continue that theme with us right now and I, I'm, I'm so excited because I think, again, there is such a great way of going from a higher level to a lower level that was discussed as part of the keynote that we can actually dig into now. Well, indeed we do. And I'd like to welcome to the Cube studio Ashesh Badani. Ashesh Badani, he is the Senior Vice President and Chief Product Officer at Red Hat. Thank you so much for coming back to the Cube, Ashesh. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Rob. I'm so happy to be back. Yeah. So, uh, that is indeed the question of the hour. Why is it so important to make AI easier and, and can we truly open source AI? Yeah. Uh, so you, you've been following the space for a little while, absolutely exploded from a customer interest perspective, right? Um, hard to have a customer conversation today without AI being one of the top things you talk about. Well, there's another, another thing, but maybe we'll get into that one <laughs> later. <laughs> I'll hold that, okay, so sorry, let me switch back. Okay, so AI. Um, but then, there is also a lot of discussion around this notion of AI and openness, right? And I think folks are a little bit sort of, hey, I've got data that might be proprietary. Um, I don't know how much of this is sort of going in. Um, how do I sort of hold that back? Um, one, how do I have something that's truly open? And then two, how do I bring the power of community to enhance it? Um, and it's funny that those are the two big questions because to Red Hat that feels like such a natural place this to go. This is your wheelhouse. Yeah, exa exa exactly, yeah. right? And so this idea of, look, how can we bring our philosophy of openness you know, to it, number one. And number two, how can we then expand the number of people, right, in a specific company, but more importantly around the world, contribute to making it better. And I think that's, that's probably what you heard, or at least I hope what you heard all this morning. Yeah, and I, I think part of it is, and we were riffing on that, just kind of doing a little keynote analysis before this, and I, I think, again, you, you hearken back to the, just six months ago when the AI Alliance was announced and launched into public-private and Red Hat and IBM and AMD and Intel and a number of others are in part of that along with a lot of the different universities. I think that openness and how it comes together, but I, I think what was also I guess you could say striking from the product announcement side was really how it goes from Podman AI to RHEL AI to OpenShift AI. Kind of help us unpack that a little yeah. bit about the announcements that you made today. Well, great question, right? So let's start with first principles here. So first, uh, great collaboration and partnership with IBM Research, right? Uh, an extremely, extremely brilliant group of folks uh, at IBM Research. Um, who've been building out these models, right? And you know, we showed results of the Granite models performing against a lot of different models, right? Of similar size, with both permissive and non-permissive licenses, and you know, great outperformance, right? Uh, of, of those models. So we start with a very solid base of those models. Then after that, we say, well, now what can we do to that to augment and improve it, right? And that's where the whole Instruct Lab methodology comes in, right? And again, that's the work that uh, has been done by IBM Research. Uh, academic papers now published around that. A blog is out explaining um, exactly the underpinnings of that. But the idea is a fundamentally, you know, really, really interesting and a simple one, right? Which is the LLM, the, the model, has a certain amount of knowledge. One, we have a lot of knowledge right here Right, and then in each company itself, how do we make sure that we can bring that power of the knowledge into the model, and two, then how do we make sure we can enhance it, right? We're teaching it new skills to do new things, some of which might be very specific to you. So for example, you don't need a massive model if let's say you're doing customer support, like your model doesn't need to know about how to predict you know, future weather patterns. So then can we just give it enough knowledge and skills to do that job and that job really well, and then of course much more, much more cheaply, much more efficiently. Yeah, we, we, when we see that, in fact in the ETR data, our, our partner that we have that does, uh, talks to 1800 organizations every quarter, when they started to look at that, you know, cust you know being able to do code, you know, code generation, being able to do customer support, customer success, and then you start to look at how do you do marketing type stuff and writing content, and those were kind of the big three, and it, it seems like really what you're bringing to bear is how do you focus 
instead. Like you said, hey, you don't need a 70 billion parameter model to right. per, per se go and read all of your, you know, read in all of your support manuals and read in all of your support tickets and how they were solved and things. How do you see people getting started? I mean, Instruct Lab was great. And again, I, I had a little bit of insight that that might be coming, so I was like, okay, this is really cool. I went and read through it, and in fact, I'm probably going to play with it over the summer time frame. I have a different use case, but uh, predicting which beer I'm, I might want to go and have next, <laughs> or something like that, an IPA, a stout, or what have you. But when you start to look at people taking their own data, this was the thing, is the data privacy, and that's their intellectual prop property. Is that how you see, because I think the demo actually did a really good job of this, and, that Chris was up there talking about how it flows through. Is that where you see people and your, the organizations you talk to that are like, hey, this is why we went with Instruct Lab and Podman AI. You can do it at a lower cost, you can do it on a laptop, it's all inside your walls, you don't have to really worry about that. Is that really one of the underpinnings? So one, yes, the uh, AI lab that is an extension for Podman desktops, really important to make it easier for developers to play with this model directly on their, on their laptop, make it easy for them. Uh, and then do it in, you know, with, with containers, right, which is what they are uh, familiar with as well. Um, but having said that, first thing we want to make sure is that make it open for a community to participate in. Right. Now, an, a particular enterprise can then say, look, I'll take a version of that model, right, and then add specific skills or knowledge that I want that is very pertinent to my business. Um, but I think that maybe the more important thing for us to do is how do we just expand the aperture of the number of folks who can build into the model, right? And then that, over time, will iterate and make it better, right? And so I think the power really lies in you know, the openness and the community aspect, and then of course, to your point that you're trying to make here, Rob, is we then productize a version of that for customers who want you know, support around it, support of the Instruct Lab technology, support of the models, uh, support around some of the runtimes around it, and then the life cycle with it. Because it is domain experts, but they're not necessarily data scientists who exactly. are in fact doing the training of these models exactly. and, and giving the knowledge and right. the skills. Right. So can you talk a little bit, so that's Instruct Lab, talk a little bit now about Rel AI too. So Rel AI then, will, what it'll do is then give you a productized version of a lot of that, right? Productized version of the model. As you know, we've, uh, in collaboration with IBM Research, open source both a language and code assistant models. Um, so give you productized versions and support around that. Uh, the runtimes that go with it, uh, uh, AI accelerators for, for, for GPUs um, that are part of that as well. Uh, and then a containerized you know, Rel image that, that you can run that with and then you can run that definitely on your desktop. But then, as people start running it, and you probably saw it in the demo, and you start running it at scale, then you say, well, I'm now running in a multi-server environment, I'm running a distributed environment, what can I do with that? And that's when we introduce OpenShift AI, right? And so Rel AI, uh, you can use independently, and, and we'll help support you with it, and then you can also get that as part of OpenShift AI. With OpenShift AI, you can use models that we provide, and Rel AI uh, capabilities, of course, but you can also bring your own model. Right, from anywhere, right? From you know, Mistral or Llama or maybe some fine-tuned model that a company has got of their own. And again, we'll help support uh, and lifecycle that too. And it, it would seem like that the whole, the RHEL image actually that you can now run as a container, but it, right. it's a full boot it's a, image yes, as well. Yes, is, is a, It was interesting to me, that, that one was the most interesting one. Because <laughs> I'm sitting there going, okay, so I'm running a RHEL image that boots in a container, but it's a full, it's a full on full, yes. RHEL server yes. in there. Yes. How does that play with things like OpenShift virtualization, which is slightly different in how it works? Yeah, so that was the second conversation <laughs> that comes up, <laughs> right? So AI, right, yeah. and the close behind is virtualization. Um, with OpenShift virtualization, you know, we have a, a slightly different tag, right? Uh, of course, we take advantage of the same underlying OpenShift platform. So maybe that's the theme you're starting to notice, right? Yeah. Uh, underlying foundation of everything is RHEL. You know, using RHEL as our uh, host uh, platform, right, we uh, provide OpenShift on top of that. And then with OpenShift, we give you capabilities to run uh, virtual machines, right? So VMs that you've got, you know, outside in, let's say, another provider, um, and you can bring them in, um, have KVM orchestrate those virtual machines, 
via Kubernetes, right? So same orchestrator that you use for your containers is also used for your virtual machines. Um, extremely powerful idea as well for customers who want to say, look, I've already gone on the journey to containerize my environment. How do I bring in you know, VMs that are sitting outside and be able to run them here and then manage them in the same way that I manage my containers? Now, you can add RHEL to that as well, right? Because now that's bootable you know, as a, a full running instance you know, as a container image. So all the pipelines that you set up, all the practices your developers are used to, um, can all now support rail running in the same as well. So it now becomes very seamless end to end. Doesn't mean you have to consume it all, but if you do want to, right, we want to make sure we provide you that end to end experience. Yeah. So how does Red Hat's product strategy, I mean one of the things that Rob and I were talking about earlier is that this, your product strategy and your approach really aligns with your previous successes and the way you've approached Linux and, and, and hybrid cloud computing, Kubernetes. How would you say that this is aligning with those previous successes, particularly when it comes to allowing organizations to innovate at their own pace, because while the staggering, well the change, the pace of change for AI is staggering, we know that not every company is, 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 at, the, is at the same place. It's a great question, Rebecca. We, we get that a lot too, right? Uh, companies actually wondering, you know, that the rate of change and pace in AI is so high, how do you keep up? Um, so the good news that we've seen, and you've probably seen this, right? Every technology evolution that you go to, and you, know, you can argue AI is probably one of the biggest ones we've seen in at least a couple of decades. Uh, the, the rate of change, the velocity is, is extremely high in the beginning, right? And we're seeing that right now, right? Which is great, all the innovation that's happening. Uh, and then the question is, what can you do in there, right? Where you can say, look, where do I extract the value that we know customers will trust us to be able to do? We've done the same with Linux. Right, uh, proprietary OS's were proliferating, right? Make sure that they're the power of the community can go and provide an open source alternative to that. Did that with Kubernetes, right? Again, uh, an, an open source alternative to what is proprietary out there. And now we're applying that same playbook to AI, right? Because there are now so many options out there and there's so much confusion around you know, how permissive and non-permissive these are, plus requirements that customers have and they are evolving and changing and we're doing now the same on the AI front. So, you know, for us, it doesn't feel like it's that different, right, from our history. It feels like we're building on heritage, right? We're building on the shoulders of the giants like we've historically done. Yeah, I, I think that to me is, is really one of the keys to Red Hat's success, is the fact that it's, hey, ha here's how we roll it out, and I, I know there's stuff going on in Ansible as well that ties into the, how to orchestrate and govern all of this AI, and, I, Help us understand where, where do you see organizations and they want to, where should they start? Right. Because I think that is the key. And we even, you talked about this yesterday when we were at the customer event, the excellence awards that you were giving out to customers. And it's so many people are like getting super certified on things, which Gong, there it was good for him. I, mean, I can't even believe how many he got right. certifications. <laughs> but when you start to look at there's, you have people who are super deep, but then you also have the broader audience, kind of that fat middle of organizations that may not have all those skill sets or be able to have that many people. Where do you see those people getting started? Yeah, and, and so that, that comes up a lot, right? So we typically want customers to start where they're most comfortable. What do I mean by that? Um, so at this event yesterday, we had Ihe, of yeah. uh, the uh, Spanish Basque uh, uh, organization, yeah. right? And they're using natural language processing. Really interesting application, right? They built that, right, in, uh, on OpenShift, right? Cool. Last year at Red Hat Summit, we had an innovation award winner, right? it was I think uh, Banco Galicia. They again had a natural language processing application they built to help customers open accounts, again on OpenShift. Now, all the skills that they've got building that with OpenShift, they'll be able to carry forward to OpenShift AI. Right, because now they'll say, well I've now got more models coming in here, how do I manage it? Oh, there are these new serving runtimes. Oh my gosh, there's you know, uh, new ways to do distributed workloads and we announce some support for those frameworks as well. And then be able to kind of give them a path, you know, is, is a natural way. So, we'll, say, we'll take the, the path where customers are today and then give them a technology to go there. Or we'll go, for example, with customers who are doing automation, right? And they're you know, using Ansible today. We'll say, well, if you're using Ansible here, well, Ansible is great for automating on-premise. Did you know you can also use Ansible in the cloud? 
Oh, by the way, here's how Ansible will connect into your virtualization journey and how it can help you move you know, VMs from one place to another. Oh, and by the way, now that you're already using OpenShift, let us introduce you to OpenShift AI. Yeah. Right, and so we have a natural way then of you know, making sure we're working with the customer along with where they are in the journey and their level of interest and sophistication and then move them along. Meeting the customer where they are. Absolutely. Excellent. Ashesh Badani, thank you so much for coming back to theCUBE. We always appreciate your insights. Thanks again, Rebecca. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Strecce. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here in Denver. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in tech enterprise coverage.